Great. Well, welcome everyone to our panel discussion of one of Crisis Group's latest reports, Mineral Concessions, Avoiding Conflict in the DRC's Mining Heartland. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Crisis Group's website after the event. Copper and cobalt are the Democratic Republic of Congo's two largest exports and tensions between artisanal miners or individuals and small groups who dig for minerals with little mechanization and the larger industrial mining com companies who operate on the same lands have sometimes led to violent state intervention. In 2019, DRC security forces expelled over 10,000 artisanal miners from two of the country's largest industrial mining sites. Today, we will discuss how the government and mining companies can avoid conflict by fostering better ways for DRC citizens to share in the mineral wealth. As you know, International Crisis Group is an independent organization dedicated to saving lives through the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of deadly conflict. We do field research, often interviewing more than 100 people for a full report. We write detailed analytical publications that you all know and love. And we then take our recommendations to the leaders and influencers of all parties to conflicts. We have about 120 staff and we work on 55 conflicts and crises around the world. This report that we'll discuss today is part of an ongoing crisis group initiative addressing the risks of deadly conflict in the context of extractive industries such as oil, gas, and mining. In the coming months, Crisis Group will release analysis from other country and industry contexts that addresses the growing role of extractive companies in peace and security issues. We'll turn shortly to our expert panel who will place the report in context and summarize its conclusions. Later on, we look forward to taking audience questions. Just to explain how that works now, and I'll repeat it later, you can submit questions at any stage of the panel, so even now, using the Q&A box that you have at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please remember to keep your questions short and to the point, and please, please do include your name and affiliation in your question. Unfortunately, we'll only have 75 minutes total today, including the time for the author's presentation, so we may not be able to answer all of the questions we receive. Now we'll hear first from the Deputy Director of Crisis Group's Africa Program, Dina Matani, who was formerly a senior political advisor with the UN Peacekeeping Mission in DRC. Dino, can you start us off by putting this report into a broader context? Why is a conflict prevention organization like Crisis Group writing about DRC's mining industry? Thanks, Tarek. <clears throat> so, you know, when, when mining and, and conflict have been looked at in the DRC in years gone by, the focus has really been on Eastern Congo, the Kibu regions, Ituris, even northern parts of Katanga, um, where armed groups are, are most prevalent. And so the, the, the subject of mining has been closely associated with armed groups uh, in, in that part of, of, um, of the country. However, when, when, when looking at the issue of industrial and artisanal mining in Katanga, um, you know, th th this is a new thing that Crisis Group has turned its attention to, uh, and it really is um, uh, critical in a context where Katangan minerals, which have traditionally been mined uh, industrially, but also increasingly artisanally, um, have uh, represented um, over the years uh, the, the, the you know the, the the cash base of of, of any incumbent regime of the state. Um, this is where the most valuable resources are, are coming from. And, and so right now, we're, we're looking at this issue in a um, particular context of political transition um, uh, in the DRC. Um, and since President Chisikedi uh, is, is trying to take control over institutions and finances of the state, including the state mining company, Jacqueline, and other sources of revenue, um, you know, the, the issue of how uh, uh, mining in Katanga uh, is managed is central to, to, to the, the question of political transition in the DRC itself. So there's the first um, reason. Secondly, um, you know, as, as the new president, or well, he's been in, in office for more than, than a year now, is, is turning his attention to delivering on his uh, promises of economic development. And given the fact that, um, you know, he still has not got in his hands the, 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 the full uh, gamut of, of, um, of, financial, um, of financial control over, the, over uh, state assets, including Jacqueline. He's trying to now deliver um, 
possibly to artisanal uh, miners, a way for them to, to um, uh, uh, earn revenues for themselves, space for them to operate, uh, and therefore in itself that will calm down tensions on the ground between two core constituents of, of miners uh, that are operating in, in Katanga. Uh, those that are uh, from Katanga themselves, which is uh, the, the home province of former President Kabila, and those miners um, uh, that have migrated into Katanga from Kasai, which is the region of President Chisikedi. And not to say that each, that the former president, the president, the existing president are behind those two constituents, but certainly if uh, the, the, the scope of the, of the political transition is, is, you know, moves into, into more rocky waters or into more choppy waters, we may see um, uh, competition between those two, you know, competition between the, t the two uh, big men of Congolese politics reflect and play out between, between the two constituents of Kasayan and, and Katangan, Katangan miners who, who, who are increasingly scrambling uh, to get their hands on these resources on the ground. So um, uh, from a conflict mitigation point of view, I think the thrust of this report really touches on how to uh, um, offer artisanal miners both as a, as a conflict mitigator for local tensions, but also within the con context of this broader political transition that's taking place at the very highest levels of Congolese politics. Terrific, thank you so much, Dino. We'll turn next to Crisis Group's Deputy Project Director for Central Africa, Nelika Vandewal, who has previously served as a diplomat in Kinshasa and with the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC. Nelika, can you build on what Dino was just saying and, and tell us a bit more about how does mining fit into the national political dynamics in DRC? Yes, thanks, Tarek, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. So what we see in the report is that it addresses tensions between industrial and artisanal miners and focuses also on challenges that, pres that President Tshisekedi faces in reforming the mining sector and preventing violence. And I've been asked today to put the report a bit into, into context and to focus a bit on uh, political events that are currently unfolding uh, in the DRC. Um, Dino already pointed out that Chisikidi assumed office a year and a half ago, so in January 2019, after, I think we can safely say, contested elections, and by allegedly making a deal with his predecessor, Joseph Kabila. He, as Dino mentioned, he made a few promises, and one of the things that he said was that he vowed to combat poverty and to stabilize the country, especially the East. He also wanted to make sure that the Congolese population, including artisanal miners, there are about, 20, uh, there are about 2 million of them in, in the DRC, and they usually have limited economic opportunities. And Chisikedi wanted to make sure that uh, the artisanal miners and the Congolese population benefit more directly from the country's wealth and not just the elite. Because what you see is that the DRC, it holds a very large share of the world's mineral wealth in particular, as um, Tarek also mentioned, copper and cobalt, in which artisanal miners are particularly active. But apart from uh, the, the wealth of the nation, about 70% of the population itself, they live in extreme poverty. What we've seen over the past year and a half is that Chisikidi has limited room for maneuver to reform the mining sector and to ensure that the Congolese share in the sector's profit. And that's mainly because of his uneasy coalition with his predecessor, Joseph Kabila. Um, Joseph Kabila's FCC um, has the majority in parliament and Chisikedi basically only has the presidency. So he therefore is obliged to work with the FCC with his current coalition, which is called Cash. Apart from a majority in parliament, Chise um, Kabila also has the head of the General Assembly, the head of the Senate, uh, the Prime Minister. And I think you, you can say that the coalition between these two men and their two uh, political blocs has been quite rocky and shaky from the start. What you also see is that tensions increased since the beginning of this year when Chisikidi tried to act independently 
So Kabila has secured access to the state finance, basically by uh, controlling the Minister of Mines and Finance, and he also has the Minister of Polio, who is responsible for uh, public companies. But he, uh, Kabila also secured positions in ministries such as defense and justice. I briefly want to touch uh, a few indicated Chisikedi is distancing himself from Kabila and trying to. I'm sorry, it seems we're having some technical difficulties with Nelika's connection. So hopefully she'll be able to rejoin us, maybe without video. Nelika, are you back? Yes. Do you want me to do without video? Where did I drop out? Oh, well, your connection's good now. We'll, we'll let you, you dropped out about a minute ago, I think. We were having uh, interference. Now, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the last thing you, you picked up on? Um, well, why don't you uh, just go back to um, the, the broader framing of the, the coalition dynamics? Okay, as I said, and do let me know when, when I, it's, mm -hmm. it's my internet, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, so, as I pointed out, Chisikedi and Kabila are in this very shaky and unstable coalition. And that's basically because Kabila almost controls everything from parliament to strategic ministries uh, to people within the army. But recent developments, and I think you, that's what you saw over the past, is it okay now? Okay, good, sorry. <laughs> what, you, what you saw over the past few weeks and even days is that um, Kabila, that Chisikidi has been trying to dismantle Kabila's network and he's slowly trying to get control over the political network that he has. Uh, politically, when we look at, for instance, the Minister of Justice, Tunda, who belongs to Kabila's FCC coalition, he was briefly arrested recently and resigned over the weekend. Uh, however, this could result in another power struggle because Kabila has said that he might put forward uh, Ramazani Shadari, who was Kabila's Dauphin during the 2018 elections. He's not very uh, much loved by the uh, Kash coalition. At the military level, Chisikedi is also trying to disempower certain armed groups and making FRDC replacements. And that could also result to further tensions, but it could also mean that Chisikedi is slowly gaining control within the DRC. When it comes to mining, uh, we have to point to the recent approval of the Minister of um, Portefeuille, Portfolio, uh, to replace the head of Gicamine. So Gicamine is the state, the state mining company and a very important player in, in the mining sector. The Gicamine was led uh, since 2010 by Albert Juma, who is a very close Kabila ally. And he was even put forward last year as a potential prime minister but Chisikedi opposed that. Um, Chisikedi already uh, appointed his replacement last May, so May 2019, but that was only approved in June this year. And Chisikedi now managed to get an ally at the top of Shikamin, uh, Kienge, uh, and we think that it is likely that it will allow him uh, to exert more influence over the state mining company though it is unclear how much leverage he will have and if and how Kabila will uh, retaliate. Maybe just to, to end my point on the, uh, on the political context is that uh, I already said things are shifting over the past few days. Things are heating up. Today there are even uh, demonstrations in Kinshasa, which basically have to do with the replacement of the president of the Electoral Commission. But it, it, it basically shows that um, this bras de verre, as we say in French, between Chisikedi and Kabila is not over yet and it will further complicate uh, Chisikedi's efforts and attempts to uh, live up on his promises that he made when he assumed office. Wonderful. Th thank you for that uh, incisive um, political overview, Nelika. Um, if I can come back to you for, for a follow-up question, um, help us sort of connect these issues now to, to the mining sector more directly and, and particularly what is the government's response been so far on the issue of artisanal mining? 
Yes, so in, in the report, we also try to address how these tensions between artisanal and industrial miners could be eased and what the role of the government in that scenario is. I, on the government response, I would like to make two, two points. And that is first the, uh, the mining code that was newly adopted in 2018, which could indeed contribute to easing the tensions between these different types of miners for two reasons, because it, it compels industrial mining companies to invest part of their revenues, even though it concerns only a very small part of their revenues, 0.3%. And according to the mining code, they have to invest that percentage into community development projects. So that basically means that residents of mining areas that sometimes don't really benefit from the fact that they live in such a rich, mineral rich area, that they will now receive a small part of the mining revenue and will thus benefit from the fact that they live in such an area. Another reason is that according to the mining code, um, artisanal miners have to be members of a cooperative. And the mining code also allows industrial mining companies to then subcontract these artisanal mining cooperatives. Uh, and they can subcontract them to do part of the work. And as a result, the, because of the subcontracting, uh, artisanal miners are often allowed to charge higher prices compared to selling their products to buying houses. So in short, this mining code provides greater economic opportunities to artisanal mining uh, and artisanal miners in particular. But, uh, and that's the second point that I would like to make. In November last year, uh, the Prime Minister of the DRC issued two degrees and they basically came into, into being with support of close uh, uh, Kabila allies. And these two degrees could complicate matters uh, for artisanal miners. And that's basically because of one of the degrees that authorizes the state mining company Sheikh Amin, as I just pointed out, which was until recently led by Albert Juma, Sheikh Amin will be allowed to set up a subsidiary, uh, which is called Entreprise Générale du Cobalt, which I think we can define it basically as a monopoly. It will have the exclusive right to buy cobalt mined by artisanal miners. And this could undermine the mining code of 2018, be 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 but <laughs> because, because of this uh, monopoly, Industrial miners are no longer allowed to buy directly from uh, the artisanal cooperatives. And uh, a final point why um, this specific degree could complicate matters for artisanal miners is that the authorities, when we spoke to them uh, in March this year, uh, when I was in Kinshasa right before uh, the world uh, stopped turning, uh, I spoke to uh, officials of the mining ministry and they said that the degree was specifically established to make sure that artisanal miners benefit from it. But it, it remains to be seen uh, whether artisanal miners will get a fair price because of this subsidiary. Um, to end uh, my contribution to this discussion, earlier this year, uh, it was announced that this so-called Entreprise Générale du Cobalt would already enter into force um, in the first half of 2020. But because of COVID-19, a lot of things has slowed down. And so it was the establishment of the Entreprise Générale du Cobalt. So for the moment, these are hypothetical issues that we discuss, and it is unclear uh, whether it will indeed happen. Thanks, Tarek. I hope it was still good to follow. <laughs> Thank you, Nelika. I think we had a better connection on the, on the second half, so that, that was great. Um, let's Thank turn you. now to Crisis Group's Economics of Conflict Fellow, a new Greek drink, for more insights on the local conflict uh, dynamics around mining sites. Um, and, and as Dino mentioned earlier, Nuke, uh, many analyses of mining and conflict on the DRC focused on the east, but this report looks specifically at the southern provinces of Hotkatanga and Ulalaba. Why is that? So, to put it crudely, this is because Alcatanga and Lualaba is where the money is. So if we look at DRC's overall exports, um, we see that over 75% of all DRC exports uh, come from two resources, copper and cobalt. And these are 
almost exclusively mined in Arcatanga and Lua Lava. Um, so also these two resources are of increasing strategic importance, both copper but to a larger extent cobalt are a key ingredient in rechargeable batteries, um, which um, there's of course a, a strongly increasing demand for those products as we see more electric cars, etc. So you also mentioned that um, a lot of reports focus on the DRC East, uh, the Kivus, for instance, when they look at mining. Um, that seems to be because we have evidence there that mining uh, funds armed groups in these areas. So that's not necessarily the case if we have not found any evidence that that is the case in Alcatanga and Lualaba, but that doesn't mean that minerals and resources are not a contentious and conflictual issues in these provinces. Um, I've already seen it alluded to in the Q&A also, um, there is a long history of conflict around mineral resources in Alcatanga and Lualaba. Uh, both provinces used to be part of the Katanga province and this is a long history of, of separatism. And key narrative in this separatism is that Katangi's mineral wealth is being stolen either by the power holders who sit in Kinshasa, or by immigrants from other provinces, notably from nearby province of Kasai. So there are a lot of Kasayan immigrants in Alcatanga Lualaba, a lot of them artisanal miners. Um, and uh, historically in the early or the late 90s, and this has led to um, large-scale violence, some say even ethnic cleansing, in which a lot of Kasayan immigrants were being displaced and even killed. So mining is a very sensitive issue and uh, we're worried about this dynamic for a number of issues um, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, it was already mentioned, uh, Tsisikedi comes from Kasai, whereas Kabila comes from um, uh, Katanga. So any tensions in the coalition that Nelika has already spoken so eloquently about are felt especially keenly in our Katanga and Lualaba. Um, it's also the case that this state monopoly cobalt buyer and Treprix General du Cobalt, which uh, Nelico also mentions, is looked upon with great suspicion in Alcatanga Lualaba as a potential way for Kinshasa or even someone from Kasai to take away Katangi's mineral wealth. And lastly, we see that with a worsening economic situation and a spike in criminal violence in big cities such as Lumumbashi, um, there is a tendency to scapegoat Kasayan immigrants um, for both stealing livelihoods and for this increase in criminal violence. And this has led to riots and anti-Kasayan demonstrations, which are of course very worrying development. Thank you, Anouk. And I know that picks up on one of the questions that, that we might come back to, to later when we get to the Q&A. Um, the, the report profiles three specific copper and cobalt mining sites in Hokitanga and Lulapa. What lessons can we draw from comparing and contrasting these three sites? Yeah, um, so indeed we studied three copper cobalt mining sites in detail. And what these copper cobalt mining sites all have in common is that it's an instance of um, where artisanal miners, small scale miners, have tried to encroach on or mine on industrial mining concessions or land that is under industrial license. Um, so what all these three sites have in common is that there are very few opportunities for artisanal miners to mine legally in the area. So in theory by law artisanal miners can only mine legally in an artisanal mining zone. Um, so there are very few of these zones and where they've previously existed and have proven to be very interesting, like high mineral grades have been found, often they've been turned on into industrial concessions. So we see that there are very few artisanal mining zones around and those that are around are just not very viable or have not been proven to be viable and people aren't sure whether there's minerals there. Um, so this forces artisanal miners onto industrial concessions and indeed we see that in the entirety or see only 1% of mine, artisanal mining sites are actually in artisanal mining zones and over 60% are on industrial concessions. So that is the commonality between these three research sites that we study. Of course, there are also differences between these three sites. So we've compared sites with different levels of violence. And one site that had a very uh, recent, very large outburst of violence went over, or 
thousands of artisanal miners were expelled from the site, um, all the way down to a site where there has been no reports of violence that we've been able to find. And what we see is that those sites that offer better livelihood opportunities for artisanal miners experience the least amount of violence. So better livelihoods, the least amount of violence. So our most violent site, which is the Tenke Fungo Rume mining site, the industrial mining company there has been almost since it started mining there, it's been trying to keep artisanal miners off of its site at all costs. Um, ultimately, this has proven to be very ineffective. And it's almost impossible because these mining sites are so large, it's almost impossible to keep artisanal miners out. And even when ultimately the state army was sent in to throw artisanal miners out, we see that with a very short space of time, they come back reporting that they've paid off uh, elements of the military to get back on these sites. Um, at the other two mining sites that have experienced least, less violence, we see that companies have a more lenient attitude towards artisanal miners, give them access to at least some often low-grade um, mineral deposits. So in one of these sites, Luishiwishi mine, and that was sort of in a similar state of play as uh, the Tenke Fungurume mine um, in a few years ago, where they called in the army to throw artisanal miners off their site. Again, this has proven to be very ineffective. And since then, they've more or less made a U-turn on how they treat artisanal miners. So rather than keeping them off at all costs, um, they seem to have allowed artisanal miners access to low-grade deposits, etc., offering them more livelihoods opportunities. And then to top it off, our site that has experienced the least amount of violence is also the one that seems to provide them the most livelihood opportunities to people around the mining site. They have a large program, a livelihood program. Um, but also, again, we see this fairly lenient attitude toward artisanal miners, where they're allowed access to deposits that are not commercially viable. Thank you, Anouk. Um, so moving on to, to the recommendations from the report, what are the, the sort of key steps that the crisis group recommends going forward? Yeah, so um, there are a number of recommendations that we make. Um, first of all, we recommend to the DRC government to establish new artisanal mining zones and where these are established to protect those from being converted into industrial licenses. Um, so that's one of our recommendations, but we also acknowledge that no matter how many artisanal mining zones will be established, given how, many, how much of the land is already licensed out, this can never, never absorb all artisanal miners that are currently active. Um, so what we also is, uh, recommend is to both industrial mining companies and the DRC government to foster cooperation between artisanal and industrial miners. So as, as Nelik has already highlighted, this is possible under DRC law, industrial mining companies can subcontract to artisanal miners. But we recommend that the DRC government clarify how this arrangement sits with these new decrees that Nelika also spoken about. Um, Further on, we uh, recommend to industrial mining companies to seriously consider their options when it comes to cooperating with artisanal miners. Um, cooperation with artisanal miners is not a very popular option among industrial mining companies um, because artisanal mining has a very bad reputation. It's been connected in the past, rightfully so, to uh, supporting uh, armed groups, to uh, unsafe environmental practices, unsafe health and safety practices, uh, child labor, etc. So there's an extreme reluctance on the part of industrial mining companies to cooperate with artisanal miners. Um, but what we also see is that the status quo where artisanal miners are present in an unregulated way on industrial mining sites. And often these industrial companies that run these mining sites get blamed anyway for whatever practices are going on. We, we think that it's a better option for industrial miners to actually cooperate and which could be beneficial to both sides. Um, for in, on the part of industrial mining companies, it can mean that they can exploit um, parts of their concession that they cannot commercially viably mine industrially, but also that they have actually more control over the practices of artisanal miners that may operate on their site. And of course, for artisanal miners, it would offer them a way to mine legally. And then lastly, we have recommendations for those setting standards in mining. Um, so again, 
artisanal mining has a very red reputation um, and um, there are a lot of standards that rightfully say well there needs to be due diligence on how artisanal miners operate um, but we would also recommend that these standard setters also recognize the role that artisanal mining plays in providing livelihoods for a lot of individuals two million people in the two million two million individual in the congo alone um, so we recommend that standard settings take the lead in um, in uh, driving an attitude shift vis-a-vis -vis artisanal mining. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anouk, for summarizing that. Do you know, let, let's come back to you um, in just a moment. I, I want to let the audience know this is going to be the last intervention um, from our panelists, and then we're going to be taking questions. So, so now's a good time to go back down to that Q&A box. We've already collected a few. Um, and if you want to add more, um, we're about to open this up. But before we do, Dino, um, there's been a considerable amount of news coverage around mining companies and their downstream buyers facing growing challenges in addressing the integrity of their supply chains. Can you address why regularizing cooperation with artisanal miners is the right approach here rather than some alternative? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that the, the, the case that is most um, uh, well known about is, is the one last year where a number of electronics companies, Apple, Dell, Microsoft, Tesla, and Google, uh, got some bad press about their alleged buying of artisanally produced materials, which included material produced by, by child labor. Um, from reading the court documents related to this case, it's, it's not always clear whether um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a class action suit, uh, but it's not, it's not always clear whether the plaintiffs recognize that the artisanal miners were working legally or illegally on sites owned by the companies mentioned, um, the industrial companies producing this material. And therefore, whether the materials were going into supply chain of those industrial miners or not. It, it could have been the case that in some cases you had artisanal miners mining illegally and then taking those minerals out into, into other supply chains that are not the ones that the industrial miners are directly supplying to, 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 to other intermediary companies that then feed those electronics companies. But whatever the case uh, may be, the electronics companies or, or, or clients of these industrial miners found themselves caught up in a scandal, uh, the, the one necess not, not, not necessarily one of, of their own making. Um, that being said, I think the overall uh, lesson, if there is one, um, is, is that with the artisanal sector so, so, so poorly regulated, in the sense that um, those who are mining aren't, aren't subject to any labor laws or, or child uh, labor laws or, or, or health and safety standards, it's hardly surprising that these scandals emerge out into the open when, when so much of this material is being produced um, by literally by the hand, by picks and shovels. Um, so that there's no doubt also that some of this material that is produced um, on these industrial mining sites, but artisanally, is still getting into global supply chains or it wouldn't be mined or, or, or sold in the first place. So it is going somewhere. Um, and, and therefore, whether these electronic companies that were mentioned in this lawsuit were implicated or not, some of them, if not them, then others, will, however, be inevitably tainted at some point by artisanal um, production that involves child labor, uh, etc. So, so that, being, that being the case, I, I think it would be better for, for all the companies involved, um, uh, both the industrial companies, but also the consumers of, these, um, uh, of this material, so the electronics companies, particularly given the fact that we're going through um, an industrial cycle where tech businesses in the context of COVID are, are, are going to be, you know, um, increasingly part of the future way of doing business. Um, uh, and the demand you can just see from Tesla's oil um, uh, own stock price going through the roof is, is, is a sign of things to come. So it would be better for, 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 for all those companies involved in the supply chain to, um, encourage where possible the integration of artisanal mining into the formal supply chain of industrial companies. So through these subcontracting mechanisms that we've foregrounded in, in our report, um, by way of, you know, then controlling or getting a hand on 
the way that those materials are produced by picks and shovels or by artisanal cooperatives. So, you know, then implanting maybe somebody who's um, responsible for um, maintaining supervision over standards, ensuring that child children aren't being used, ensuring that, you know, that, that, that miners who are um, digging this material are doing so safely uh, and in compliance with, with uh, human rights and other community standards. Great, thank you for that, Dino. Um, we'll now move to take some audience questions from the Q&A box. So as a reminder, if you'd like to add a question at this time, just go and click on Q&A um, at the bottom. Um, make sure to keep your questions short um, and to the point. Um, if you can also include your name and affiliation, we'd appreciate that very much so that we can, um, it doesn't always show up in, in our view of Zoom, um, depending on how you've logged in. So that's very helpful. Um, and, and I think we'll come back to Nelika for the first question here. Um, this is from uh, Milan Fayoulou uh, with Intel Congo. Uh, Tisiketi knew what he was doing uh, by going into accepting the deal that handed him the presidency. So um, how do you see then the back and forth between these, these partners? Do you, do you see um, this as theatrics or as reality in terms of the tensions that are playing out on the ground? Thanks, Tarek, and thanks for this question, which is, of course, quite pertinent considering uh, the day-to-day -day events in the DRC. When you look at the first year of Chisikedi's presidency, even though he might have been aware that the deal uh, he entered in with, with Kabila, I think during his first year, he really wasn't a very active president and he couldn't really get anything done. That was basically because he was being, um, he received a lot of pushback from, from Kabila's FCC. For instance, he appointed the prime minister in May last year, but it was only until September last year that the cabinet was formed and that the coalition actually could start to, to govern and to function. Uh, recent events, I think they've shown that Chisikedi is indeed trying to dismantle Kabila's network, but also to take matters of control in, in his own hand. And that started in December last year, when he said during his so-called State of the Union that 2020 for him would be a year of action. And I think he was also receiving pressure from within his political party, UDPS, from international actors, and probably, sorry, someone told me I keep freezing. I'll just switch it off then. Um, so, in, in, two, in December 2019, Chisikedi said that 2020 would be his year of action. And he also received pressure from international actors, from his UDPS political party, and of course also from himself to distance himself from, um, from Kabila because of the 2023 re-election. And recent events, as I pointed out, um, he tried to get control of the military he tried to replace a few officers in, in government. Um, and yeah, I think these indicate that he's distancing himself from Kabila and I wouldn't call it theatrics in that way. I think he's seriously trying to uh, make his uh, presidency worth his while and to live up to his, uh, to deliver on his promises. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nalika. Um, and apologies about your technical issues. Um, you know, let's come back to you. We, we have a couple of questions um, here around the history of Gekmind and um, its engagement um, in some of these dynamics at the local level between the Katangis and the Kasai. Um, can, can you tell us a bit more about how we understand the history of this, um, this government agency's engagement in those tensions? Well, I mean, if you go back to the 60s, you, you, you know, we all remember the, uh, you know, in the aftermath or around the time when um, Prime Minister Lumumba was assassinated or disappeared, uh, there was a, the attempt of Katangan secession there that was backed by, you know, foreign forces who were um, keen to, 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 to affect that change to, you know, because of, because of course Katanga was the, 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 the mineral base of the country in many respects. So, of course, this is, this is nothing new and, you know, over the years during um, the dictatorship of, of Mobutu, um, uh, while Mobutu is not himself from, from Katanga or Kasai, 
the, the, the Katangan wealth essentially, you know, was, was used as a, as, a, as a cash cow for, for the regime um, with its proceeds plundered and, and, and squandered on, on uh, you know, uh, even building a, um, a castle in the equatorial jungle. Now, um, <clears throat> when it comes to what's happening now, this is very interesting because uh, in the, in the run-up to these elections, the, the, the Katangan elites uh, were making it very clear that they would be very against um, a, a new president coming in who wasn't from that region. And of course, Kabila being Katangan was, was being pressured to step down. But of course, the only other Katangan in, 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 in the picture was Moise Katumbi, who was, um, you know, a, an opposition to, to Kabila. So that wasn't acceptable. Um, when Chisakedi has come in, and particularly in this context where he's trying to dismantle Kabila's machinery, both financial and security machinery, there are those in the Katangan system who were tied to, 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 to Kabila and others, um, you know, who see, uh, you know, uh, who are worried about the, the dismantling of, of, of that architecture um, and, you know, who, who, who are prepared perhaps to do something about that. It's no surprise, therefore, in this context that uh, a Katangan warlord, um, Jadion, uh, who had been arrested and released, um, you know, for political purposes to be instrumentalized as some kind of pawn on a violent chessboard over the years, has now been released again. And although he's in a completely different part of the ex-province of Katanga, he's, he's now, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, stirring his, 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 his old rebellion back into life his old rebellion being called Kata Katanga, which means to cut Katanga from the rest of Congo. So you can see, you can see this, this, this sentiment bleeding back into the, into the mainstream uh, Congolese politics. The other point is, if you remember all those Congo watchers in the audience, you remember during the uh, Kamina and Sapu uh, insurgency of, of 2017 and 2018, this was the, the grassroots um, uh, uh, community-based um, uprising that took place prior to the elections, uh, you know, infused with, with um, uh, you, you know, magic and, 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 and local fetish customs that relate to, 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 to how these militias are formed. Now, now all those militias were, were from the Kasai region. Some of them had links to, to um, uh, President Chisakedi's UDPS party. And when they were not militia, they were also digging, many of them were digging diamonds in the Kasai region. And during the course of 2017, 2018, many of those Kasaians drifted down, um, particularly those of Lulua ethnicity on the border of Eastern Kasai region, started drifting down into K Kasai region and started getting involved in artisanal mining for cobalt and, and um, uh, 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 and other minerals in the Katanga region. So you can see that those constituents of local miners who sometimes act as violent actors in, in you know, at least in the Kasayan context, are now, um, you know, potentially at loggerheads with Katangan miners in, Kat in Katanga during a period of political transition between an ex-Katangan president and a current Kasayan president. And while those two presidents may not be stoking those tensions directly on the ground, as I said in the introduction, what happens in terms of the power tussle between them may feed down in terms of patronage and other kinds of political alliances on the ground that, that may lead into, into local conflict involving those two, two separate sets of mining con constituencies. So hopefully that has given a bit more background in terms of the, of the um, mechanics of, of, of of potential conflict and mining on the ground between the two communities. Thank you so much, Dino. That's that's fascinating history. Um, Anouk, if we can come back to you now, um, there's a question in the chat about um, from Danny Giernik about um, the role of illicit trade of resources and how we understand sort of the relative magnitudes. Um, can you tell us what we do and don't know about these questions? Yeah, so, um... I think this question may have been prompted by the recent UN Group of Exports report on illegal trade in gold from Eastern DRC provinces, uh, including, for instance, South Kivu. Um, I think that report concluded from memory that there's about 
two billions worth of uh, gold illegally exported from these eastern provinces um, through various uh, other countries, including to, including uh, to Uganda, and then it eventually ends up in the UAE. So, if when I mentioned that seventy five percent of uh, DRC exports are copper and cobalt, that does not include uh, illegally exported minerals. Um, so we might rightfully be skeptical of those numbers. Um, in terms of magnitude though, UN Group of Experts mentioned 2 billion in terms of illegally exported gold. Um, the, U, uh, the DRC exports of copper and cobalt amount to about 10 billion. Uh, so that would still be a multitude of that, although perhaps if all gold were legally exported, perhaps not quite 75% of all DRC exports. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Anouk, if I can come right back to you with, with another question here about um, precedents, um, either within the DRC or outside, um, how do we sort of understand some of the recommendations that, that the report is advancing about cooperation between industrial and artisanal mining companies as having some foundations uh, beyond um, th this recommendation? Yeah. So when we talk about um, best practice around artisanal miners, um, I feel that there isn't really one country that we can point to and say, well, that country has artisanal and industrial mining arranged all nice and neatly with a little bow on it. I think most countries that have a lot of artisanal miners are struggling to balance interest of artisanal miners to that of industrial miners. Um, I think there are examples of individual sites in numerous countries that have artisanal miners that do better than others. For instance, even in the DRC in Alcatanga Lualaba, and uh, I think also one example in the Kibus, there have been examples of industrial mining companies that productively work together with artisanal miners. Um, in terms of lessons from elsewhere, I think um, a lot of what we learn is that it is helpful if artisanal miners are in some way organized. Uh, now, in one way, we would think that in the DRC that would be naturally already arranged because artisanal miners are by law required to be organized into cooperatives. But of course, in practice, that's not always the case. And even if there are cooperatives, sometimes these are not cooperatives in a true sense of the word, in the sense that they are owned by their members and operate in the interest of their members. Uh, sometimes artisanal mining cooperatives are, are effectively fronts for the interest of, of wealthy local politicians or wealthy businessmen um, who exploit artisanal miners. Um, so um, um, this call or the common wisdom that artisanal miners should organize and then if they are organized their voices will be heard better and they will be better represented in national policy. Um, that is obviously a very important step but we should also be wary that not all cooperatives are alike. Um, in terms of other um, um, lessons that we've learned from elsewhere is that um, we are talking about cobalt or copper or gold, but this resource is not alike everywhere. Like there are geological differences in how particular, uh, in how gold is mined in one place versus another. So. Um, We've also learned that it isn't always such a zero sum game in terms of industrial mining companies should give up something that is extremely interesting to them in order to serve the interest of artisanal miners. And that actually sometimes there are um, deposits of say co cobalt or gold that are not so interesting to mine uh, industrially, but that are on industrial concessions because they are so large. So the space for negotiation, I think we've learned from elsewhere may be larger than we think it is. Perfect, thank you so much, Anouk. Um, Dino, I, we, we have a question here around um, returning to Kakamines and um, some of the allegations around um, sort of how the royalties around Kakamines are handled. Um, would you like to sort of give us a, some insight about um, what we know and what we don't know about those issues? Right, um, so that's, you know, very, very controversial, but also by now very well known um, uh, uh, of corruption. Um, you know, the, the, Je Jacquemin, the management of Jacquemin has always been opaque. And during the Kabila uh, um, uh, administration, the accounts of Jacquemin were never really 
audited in a way that were uh, in any way transparent. So there, there, there have been plenty of, 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 of cases of missing money, questions over Jacqueline, where are Jacqueline accounts, who's really um, uh, uh, accountable for their, um, their, their control and audit and, and so forth. So that's one, that's one thing that's, that's one aspect of Jacqueline that's always been, always been the case. And then, then there are the, the, the issues of royalties and taxes. So you have, of course, joint ventures between Jacqueline and industrial mining companies. Jacqueline takes a, a taxes or taxes are raised to the treasury. Those are also uh, not very transparent. Royalty money comes in. There have been some cases of Jacqueline accounts, um, you know, documentation that have come up in previous investigations by other public interest groups and journalists showing how money from some of those accounts have then been used in electoral preparations um, being run by a um, electoral commission whose independence has been long questioned and, and whose, 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 whose um, appointments right now at the center of, of the political tussle between Chisikidi and, and, and Kabila. Um, then you also have companies that were created off the shelf, British Virgin Island companies in the past that were created off the shelf, uh, given, um, um, you know, awarded Jacqueline, uh or stakes in some of these joint ventures in completely untransparent uh, circumstances. These, th these are from deals that go back to 2010 onwards. Um, uh, that were then created by the Israeli businessman Dan Gertler and some of his associates, a, a, a present, uh, a, a friend of President Kabila, essentially. And uh, those um, shares of those joint ventures were then also flipped into, into the hands of, of, of some of the major companies that are now operating or have been operating in, in the Katangan mining sector. But some of them retained some share of those joint ventures. Now they will be receiving royalties and payments um, that, are, that are potentially being paid still to this day offshore uh, and linked to uh, bank accounts, um, to the, to, you know, linked to these British Virgin Island registered companies or, or trusts uh, managed in Gibraltar or, or other kinds of offshore mechanisms that, that we're not fully aware of. So even till this day that there is um, undoubtedly you know, Kabila is, 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 is undoubtedly drawing on some, of, on some of those revenue streams. Great. Uh, thanks, Dino. Um, we, we have a question in the chat um, around the sort of the supply chain or really the, the ultimate, um, you know, um, the buyers of, of the commodities like copper and cobalt that are being mined. So, so what efforts um, are, are we aware of, and, and I'll pose this maybe to, to any of the panelists who want to jump in here, um, starting with Anouk. Uh, what efforts are we aware of to convince the major buyers, um, the BMWs, Apples, Volkswagens, that returning some of their profits to DRC is you know, important for the upliftment of artisanals, and, and you know, what could be done here, perhaps? So, Efforts are definitely being made in terms of returning some of mining's, mining's profits to local communities, but not very many efforts towards uplifting of artisanals specifically. So for instance, what we see is that the new DRC mining code requires mining companies to put 0.3% of their profits back into communities for community driven projects. Um, so that's, that's, of course, a wonderful development, although not all companies, some companies find ways of, of, of wiggling themselves out of that. Um, in terms of putting, like, uplifting artisanals, um, I think the main drive has been to try and um, 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 push artisanal miners out of the sector or that is the, the or offer them alternative livelihoods so a lot of what we see are alternative livelihoods programs where um, maybe um, there is a training on how to farm more productively or maybe there are still tra there are skills training in um, how to earn a livelihood from say beekeeping or sewing clothes etc personally i feel that what these programs don't really recognize is how many artisanal miners there really are. And I personally find it difficult to see how 2 million artisanal miners in the DRC can all be um, become farmers and beekeepers and sowers productively in the current state of the DRC economy. So um, I would say that in terms of the, 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 
the eventual buyers of cobalt-based products. I think BMW, I saw mentioned, but also Apple and, and, and Tesla, for instance. I think their drive has primarily been to disassociate from artisanal miners as much as possible. Whereas I, I personally don't think that is a very productive, um, a very productive attitude um, because these artisanal miners uh, are going to be around. So indeed for uh, a company like BMW or Apple or Tesla to actively support these artisanal miners would be much more interesting and a much more productive solution. Um, why couldn't we have, like we have in other um, sectors, uh, a fair trade cobalt initiative? for instance, in which um, you can buy a car in which you know that the cobalt that was mined did not exclude artisanal miners, but in fact for, to provide them with a livelihood. Fascinating. Do you know, um, I, I, I'd like to come to you with, with the same question, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, that, that there's, there's somewhat of an irony that <clears throat> in um, trying to reduce carbon emissions uh, and bring about sort of um, uh, a reduction in, in global temperatures by moving to battery powered cars, um, that dynamic is then, um, you know, potentially linked to abuses of human rights on the ground um, in a country where, which is supplying the, the essential um, material to get us to that desired endpoint of environmental change. Um, m many Congolese on the ground will say, um, you know, I've heard this being said amongst uh, Congolese in the artisanal mining sector. Nous sommes la batterie du monde. We are the battery of, of the world, and and they have a they have a point there. So, you know, a company like Tesla, for example, which is now going to be at the vanguard of getting electric cars on the road, does have a, a moral responsibility. That being said, we we know that companies don't always act on on moral grounds, uh, and this takes us back to. To the, to the point we made about, um, you know, the, 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 these, these scandals. Um, the, those um, types of, of issues are going to come up more frequently if artisanal miners, you know, and I say those types of, of, of scandals being, being the one that I referred to earlier on, are going to come up more, more regularly and concern the shareholders of some of these electronic companies or car making companies. Um, who don't want to see um, this kind of thing take place. So, so it's in the interest also of the comp company like Tesla to ensure that um, it, it's also bringing in artisanal um, uh, producers into its supply chain for no other reason than also than, than security on the ground. And given how unstable things are in the Congo right now, bringing some measure of, of mitigating local tensions on the ground, which as I explained, you know, if there are tensions between Kassayans and, and, and Katangas on the ground, that is linked to national politics. So the company does have, a, have, a, have, a, have an interest in, 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 in addressing this for its own reasons, because otherwise, if, if Kabila and, and, and Chisikedi's alliance crumbles and the country goes back into conflict, where will Tesla be getting its, its cobalt from? Uh, that whole supply chain may end up being, being prejudiced. That, that in a way is the big picture interest for companies um, acquiring these min minerals. It's, it's in their own interest. Security matters for their own supply chains. Great, um, thank you so much, Dino. I, I, I guess to, to maybe come back to you with, with a follow-up question here about um, the sort of the inverse of this. Are, are there any conditions under which companies would want to cease operations within the DRC, whether mining companies or companies further down their supply chain um, who, who are you know, major purchasers, is there anything that would drive them or, or is the dynamic such that you know, engagement and, and responsible engagement is the only pathway forward? Uh, that's, I mean, from my perspective, I, I think the riches are so um, concentrated in the DRC that, that that supply chain is so important for so many companies that, that they're gonna be loath to, to just cut their links. You, you, you know, consumers of copper and cobalt have been, have been uh, uh, carrying on businesses as, as normal throughout some of the most unstable moments of the last 10, 15 years in, in the DRC. So <clears throat> in that sense, I'm, I'm 
you know, I, I, I think it comes back to this, this question of self-interest for, for corporate actors. They need to understand that, that even though Katanga isn't necessarily associated with the blood and guts of violent conflict in Eastern Congo, which is, which is the story that has captured public imagination when it comes to conflict minerals, that, that actually when it, when it comes to Katanga, it, it drives, the, you know, the supply chains there actually, as detailed in this report, drive right to the, to the heart of, 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 of central politics and of, of core stability in, in the DRC and its elite politics right now. So, you, you know, I, I, I think it, it's going to have to be through um, adjusting their positions or adjusting their, their, the way they see the, the, um, how Katanga and their supply chains are, are connected to those politics that's going to change their, their behavior and give them the incentive to have more of these kinds of conversations with, with the government, with the authorities, and with, with artisanal cooperatives who might be part of those supply chains going forward. Thanks, Dino. Um, Anouk, to, to come back to you, I, I see there's a very specific question here um, evolve, involving um, uh, a case of Namoya mining. Uh, but you know, more, maybe more generally, if you can speak to some of these dynamics around um, when artisanal miners intersect with local militias, when, when we sort of move to, across the spectrum into sort of more direct um, confrontation and engagement instead of some of the dynamics that we've been talking about earlier. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, I think um, the case that was mentioned um, in um, Banro or Namoya mining, I think actually was mentioned in two questions. Uh, I'm not personally familiar with the case, but I do find it very interesting that um, one of the questions suggests, well, there was a productive um, cooperative of artisanal miners and its production was growing steadily and then a, 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 a local mining corporation came in and shattered that process. Um, but then another question asking, uh, asker is uh, uh, saying, uh, well, artisanal miners from local militias started, started kidnapping executives of this uh, industrial mining company. So I think, I'm, as I said, I'm not personally familiar with the case, but I think it goes to show that um, there are no good and bad guys here. There is no black and white, no clear lines in who's the good and the bad guy in this scenario. Um, there are multiple perspectives on this. There are often cases when artisanal miners are already present and a local mining company comes in. And there are a lot of pros and cons on that. Maybe the, uh, the, the industrial mining company can produce more revenue for government. That is a positive thing. But then again, if that d deprives artisanal miners of their immediate livelihoods, that is obviously a negative thing for them. Um, also, we shouldn't pretend that all artisanal miners are um, uh, consistently nonviolent and always peace-loving uh, human beings. There are definitely uh, elements within artisanal mining community that may be uh, demobilized members of uh, former militia, for instance. And um, um, it may indeed be true that they have started forming local militia and started kidnapping executives of this company. Um, it does, I think, show that there is a relatively thin line between artisanal miners mining artisanally and earning a livelihood, but also uh, moving, being members of armed groups and moving into armed groups. So to me, that suggests that we should pay special attention to artisanal mining livelihoods if they are indeed so vulnerable to uh, being recruited and re-recruited into armed groups, we should be paying special attention to artisanal mining livelihoods, more attention, not necessarily less. Thanks, Anouk. Um, we're, we're close to time, so, so I'm just going to pose um, one general question, um, maybe to Dino, and, and if others want to jump in. Um, we've received a, a few comments and questions around um, parallels between our focus on Southern DRC today and some of the dynamics that might be more well known around the east of the country. Um, can you compare and contrast um, so, some of this for us, just so the audience, obviously some of these are, are out of scope of today's discussion, but the audience can make the, the necessary connections. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we've got to look at these questions somewhat differently. Um, in the East, we're talking about the minerals of coltan, cassiterite, uh, wolframite, gold, uh, that have historically always been artisanally mined um, from, from, from this region. And yes, there is a clear, there has been over the years, clear intersections between those miners and armed groups 
Um, neighboring countries have been in, involved in sponsoring those armed groups and then drawing on those supply chains. This has all been very much uh, documented in, in public in numerous reports of the, of the UN group of experts that report to the Security Council and, and countless other reports from other NGOs and, and public interest groups journalists. Um, but, you know, it, this, that part of the country, I mean, it's almost to bring some kind of element of stability is a, is a much more complicated road ahead because of, the, because of just how entrenched those armed group interests are. In, 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 in that region. When we're talking about Katanga, of, of course, there, there are incidences of, of violent crackdowns against miners and, and um, you know, the use of, of mining uh, infrastructure and vehicles belonging to mining companies for, for the security services to, to, to crack down on, 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 on um, civilians and, and, and others in the past. But the, the scope of, of violence in Katanga, because the, the sector is more uh, I mean, the, the lion's share of production is coming out from industrial mining is, is, is much is historically much, much, much lower. So there's a, you know, foregrounding this issue in Katanga now gives us an opportunity to do something about it um, before some of those artisanal mining constituencies get more violent. Whereas, whereas in the East, you know, it's a, it's a much longer ro road ahead that has much to do actually with regional politics rather than the issue of how mining is managed itself. Um, and of course, you know, the overwhelming point is, is that the, the, the Katangan mining is the lion's share of, of Congolese revenue when it comes to, to, I mean, it dwarfs Eastern Congo on, on the scale of how much, how much dollars are pulled in from, 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 from revenue um, associated with, with artisanal mining in, in Eastern Congo, which is by comparison peanuts. Great, Anouk, do you, do you want to add anything to this? I think one of the questions asked whether there are any parallels between what we see happening in Alcatanga and Lualaba and what we see happening in Eastern DRC, uh, even though, as Dino pointed out, there's much less money at stake. And even though in Eastern DRC, we see many more artisanal miners and many fewer industrial mining companies. Um, but actually, when I was reading the UN Group of Expert report, there's one case in there um, which, if I hadn't known any better, could have been in our report as well, um, that one of the sources of illegally exported gold is, in fact, a industrial gold mine in which artisanal miners have been encroaching. The army has been, or the F FARDC has been uh, called in to protect this gold mine, but we see, in fact, that uh, elements of the FARDC are charging artisanal miners for access um, on entry to this mining site uh, and uh, are allowing them to access, uh, exit with the gold. Um, so yes, indeed, I think there are, are uh, in places strong, strong parallels between what we see happening in gold in Eastern DRC. Um, what of course is uh, even more concerning in the case of gold is that um, it's much more easily smugglable out of the country because it's much lower volume, whereas um, uh, minerals such as copper and uh, cobalt can much less easily be smuggled in quantity and often end up being refined and processed in, in country or uh, in uh, nearby Zambia. Thank you. Well, um, seeing no further questions in the chat, I'm going to bring our conversation to a close and thank each of our panelists, Dino, Nelika, and Anouk for joining us today, and all of the audience for taking this time to familiarize yourself with our work. Um, we're grateful for your questions, your comments, your engagement. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. <laughs>